Welcome back everyone to this lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. In this video we are going to continue our consideration of the trial and death of Socrates, but this time with a new, play, uh, a new dialogue of Plato's. Specifically in this video we are going to begin examining Plato's Credo. Now we should first say a few things about how this dialogue fits into the narrative structure of the dialogues that comprise the trial and death of Socrates. So remember in the Euthyphro we saw Socrates um, in, outside the courthouse before his trial. In the Apology we saw the defense he makes in, of himself at trial. And what we're going to see in Credo is a sort of jailhouse dialogue between Socrates and his close friend Credo. And what we're going to see in this conversation that they have is first, Credo attempting to convince Socrates that he should escape from prison and avoid his death sentence. Remember at the end of the Apology, the jury not only found him guilty, but did sentence him to death. And interestingly enough, even though there is no indication that Socrates really thinks he's guilty, we saw at trial him give a vociferous defense of himself and essentially charged that the accusations brought against him by Miletus and Nidus and Lycon were completely baseless. And so given that, you might expect that Socrates would be looking for any opportunity to escape from prison. Since he sees himself as being unjustly prison, imprisoned and unjustly punished, he might say, well, why can't he simply return the favor and break the laws of the state, uh, escape from prison since the state has done something bad to him, something wrong to him? However, what we see from Socrates is precisely the opposite. We're going to see Credo attempt to convince Socrates to escape prison, and we're going to see Socrates argue that in fact, no, he has a moral duty and obligation to obey the state and remain in prison and accept his punishment, even though he doesn't actually think he did anything wrong. Okay, so there's a number of arguments we're going to need to parse out here, but we should first begin by setting the stage of the dialogue. So like I said, this dialogue is sort of a jailhouse uh, conversation, and what we see is the dialogue opening with uh, Credo and Socrates um, having a conversation. Socrates is surprised that Credo is able to get in, uh, but he tells us that he bribed some of the prison guards um, because he had once done a favor for them and was able to get in prison to speak to Socrates. Now what's notable about their interaction is that we see Credo much more distressed about the prospect of Socrates' death than Socrates himself is. Right, so notice Credo's comments here. In the name of Zeus, Socrates, I wouldn't do that. I only wish I weren't so sleepless and distressed myself. I've been amazed all this time to see how peacefully you were sleeping, and I deliberately kept from waking you so that you could pass the time as pleasantly as possible. You seem to bear your fate so easily and calmly. Now there's a couple points to make here. One of the points I want to make is that I think this is a subtle or sort of subliminal allusion to one of the arguments that Socrates makes in the Apology. You remember at the end of the Apology, Socrates suggests that he has no reason to fear death because in part what death might be is essentially just a dreamless sleep. And now Credo happens upon Socrates who's sleeping in jail and says, I can't believe you're, you're sleeping uh, so pleasantly and you're not anxious and worried like I am because you're going to die soon. But of course, what does that assume? That assumes that a peaceful sleep is a good thing. And so it's somewhat ironic, I think, and I think Plato builds this in, it's somewhat ironic that Credo would be so worried about the fact that Socrates is going to die, yet so um, happy to see him peacefully sleeping. Because in Socrates' view, one major possibility for what death could be is simply just a, the equivalent of a dreamless, peaceful sleep. So that's one point to make. But of course, we should also ask ourselves, why is it that Socrates isn't more distressed about his death? In part, it goes back to the Apology, where we saw that for him to claim that he knows death is a bad thing and to fear death would be to sort of claim a kind of knowledge which he doesn't really have. And it would be to give up the intellectual humility that we said characterizes Socratic wisdom. Right, because Socratic wisdom is owning up to the things you don't know. And if you don't know that death is a bad thing, why should you be fearing it? Why worry about it? On the other hand, this is also an allusion to the next dialogue we're going to look at, which is the, uh, the Phaedo. And in the Phaedo, what, Soc what Plato has Socrates do 
is argue for the immortality of the soul. And in that dialogue, what we're going to see is that, in fact, another reason Socrates isn't going to be worried about his death is based on the idea that if the soul is immortal, then when his body dies, he hasn't actually died. In fact, he has good reason to think he will live on in some form or fashion. But we'll save most of those comments for when we talk about that dialogue. For the moment, let's just notice that Credo, very distressed about the prospect of Socrates' death, Socrates, um, he says it would be an error for someone of my age to complain when my time to die has, in fact, come. Okay, now, why does, uh, why is Credo distressed about Socrates' death at this moment? Um, to understand this, we have to know a little bit more about the context. Credo says uh, that he's brought some bad news to Socrates, naming the ship from Delos is going to return soon. So what is this ship from Delos? Um, so, one thing to know about Socrates' trial, it just so happened that the day before his trial, there was a famous uh, religious festival in Athens that, that occurred. And it, ha it happens every year, it would just happenstance, just a coincidence, that Socrates' trial happened to occur when it was beginning. Now, this festival, uh, part of this festival, we don't need to get into the details of it, but part of the festival is they send this ship out to Delos, and the festival lasts as long as it takes for the ship to return. The festival is supposed to honor one of their gods. Now, why this matters is because during the festival, there can be no executions. And this is actually why Socrates is in jail in the first place for this long. I mean, he's been there roughly a month at this point. Um, usually, if you, in Athens, if you had been convicted of a crime at trial and sentenced to death, you would be executed the next day. But it was only because of this religious festival that Socrates has survived this long and hasn't been executed. Um, and so, but Credo says, look, I found, I have heard news that the ship is going to be returning soon. And because that's the case, you're going to, to your life, um, according to the, the, the rules, according to the law, will in fact be ended tomorrow. And this, again, is making Credo extremely upset, as you would guess, given that they are in fact close friends. Now, is there any reason that Credo has, you know, bribed the guard, snuck into the prison, to see Socrates besides just speaking to his friend before his death? Well, there is a specific practical reason. Credo wants to offer Socrates the opportunity, the opportunity to escape prison. And he says he can uh, secure this opportunity because he has the money to bribe all the guards necessary to let Socrates escape. Then he can go um, and live in some other city and he can escape the punishment of Athens. And what's most important about this is that the way um, Credo pitches this to Socrates. He says, for the majority of people won't believe that it was you yourself who refused to leave this place, though we were urging you to do so. Now what's important about that uh, sentence is that Credo says appeals to the majority of people. He says, Socrates, if you don't leave prison, um, then the majority of people will just see that as ridiculous. They'll see that as sort of unbelievable. And, in fact, it's, it's uh, Credo suggests that this is a misfortune that will redound on him as well. He says before that, but look here, Socrates, it's still not too late to take my advice and save yourself. You see, if you die, I won't just suffer a single misfortune. On the contrary, not only will I lose a friend, the like of whom I'll never find again, so Credo will lose his best friend, but in addition, many people who don't know you or me well will think that I don't care about you, since I could have saved you if I'd only been willing to spend the money. So he worries that people are going to think, well, Credo has money, he has the funds necessary to, um, to allow Socrates to escape. What kind of friend wouldn't give, their, um, wouldn't give one of their best friends that opportunity? Is he really just being too cheap to not do what's best for his friend? And notice a second appeal here to the majority. He says, the majority of people who don't know either you or me, their opinions will be very bad of me. I'll, I'll get a bad reputation. And these statements lead Socrates to state the following. But my dear Credo, why should we care so much about what the majority think? And of course, this is a precisely the question Socrates would ask, because as we've seen in both the Youth of the Rome and the Apology, Socrates has a very sort of low opinion of 
the majority or what most people think. It's actually surprising given that Credo is such a close friend of Socrates, that he's one of the people who's always associated with him. It's somewhat surprising that Credo doesn't know this or doesn't wouldn't realize this. It suggests that although Credo has associated with Socrates, he hasn't really taken in his teachings or his ideas or, or his, um, his main ideas about how we should live our lives. Because for Socrates, we saw first in the Euthythro, he suggests to Euthythro that you can't just simply trust uh, you know, a group of gods and say that whatever they command is what you should do. In the Apology, he suggests at many points that the jury that will convict him is not doing so out of wisdom or knowledge, but is simply acting as a sort of mob, right, and um, is unjustly convicting him. So Socrates, at many points, we've seen him express this sort of low opinion of, of the majority of what most people think. But Credo presses the point, he says, well, you know, why should we care what the majority think? Credo says, your present situation itself shows clearly that, majority, that the majority cannot just do minor harms, but the worst things to someone who's been slandered in front of them. So Credo says, he's obviously appealing to the jury here, he says, well, you are in prison, about to die, specifically because all these slanders and these misrepresentations of you over time have led a majority, a mob rule of people in the jury, to convict you um, unjustly of a crime you didn't, you didn't commit. Doesn't your exact situation show that what you're saying isn't true? Isn't it in fact true that the majority can do very bad harm, even the worst harms to us? Okay, and this sets up really the first major argument of the dialogue. Because what Socrates is going to do is he's going to reject this idea of credos. He's going to say, in fact, the majority can do many things, but in fact, they cannot do the worst harm to me. And this general idea should already be somewhat familiar. You'll, you'll recall um, in the Apology where Socrates suggests that Although Miletus and Edus and Lycon and the rest of the jury who vote for his conviction can kill him and exile him, they can't actually harm him in any real way. He says it's impossible for a better man to be harmed by a worse. And that same sort of underlying idea is going to be in this argument as well, which I'm calling the argument from good harm parody. Now why am I calling it that? Because Socrates is going to rely on this idea that there's something similar about the ability to do harm and the ability to do good. Okay, so let's take a look at the argument that he makes for why the majority cannot actually harm us. First premise as I'm outlining it, the greatest good of the human soul is wisdom, the greatest harm to the human soul is ignorance. I don't have too much more to say about this because it's been a common theme of what we've looked at from Socrates so far. We see in the Apology, for instance, that he says, if you want to know how your soul might be in the best possible condition, well, wisdom and truth, those are the things that put your soul in the best possible condition. We also looked at passages um, from the Gorgias. It wasn't, again, one of the readings you did, but it's another dialogue that gives context. Um, when I was explaining to you Socrates' critique of sophistry, I said that for him, ignorance is a disease of the soul. Right, so remember, Socrates says, what makes you who you are, and what accounts for whether your life is going well or poorly, is the condition of your soul. Your soul is improved by wisdom and truth and gaining knowledge. Your soul is made worse by ignorance, and also by acting in immoral ways. He, he suggests also injustice. So that's the first premise. Because remember, we're trying to figure out, can the majority harm us? And so first we need to know, what does it mean to harm us? And what does it mean to make us better? So knowledge is what makes us better. Wisdom makes us better. Ignorance, ignorance makes us worse. It harms the soul. Okay, so let's look at the second premise. The second claim that Socrates makes is that the majority cannot make the human soul wise. Now, we'll get to us. You might be wondering, well, why is he making a claim about, you know, what makes the soul better, about what the majority can do in terms of wisdom. Isn't he supposed to show that the majority can't harm us? And that's true, and we'll get to that in a second. But the first claim he wants to make is simply that the majority cannot do that which improves our soul. The majority can do nothing to actually make us better. And let's look at the justification Socrates gives for this. They, the majority, 
can't make someone either wise or unwise. The effects they produce are really the result of chance. So we should think about that for a moment. What would it mean to produce a, an effect by chance? What would it mean to not produce an effect by chance? Well, if you're producing an effect by chance, we might say your actions are arbitrary. You don't really understand what you're doing. So for instance, I have a son. He's, one, he's roughly one and a half years old. And he does many things. And in some cases, he produces his desired effects. Right? He wants to stack his blocks or he wants to show me that he wants to get in his chair to eat. And it seems that he's acting with knowledge of what he's doing. Other times, he's just running around the house like a tornado, producing all sorts of effects that he has no idea about. And what's the difference? In the case where he's simply producing effects by chance, um, he's acting in a haphazard way without any idea of what he's doing. But when he's producing effects uh, deliberately, he has some desire in mind, which he says, okay, I know if I point at the fridge, then I know Dad is going to know to open the fridge and give me food. And so what Socrates wants to make this point about is not just small children and their development, right? In part, part of your development as a human being is your ability to not only act through chance, but also to say, okay, how can I best achieve my ends? How can I best achieve my goals? But he doesn't want to just make that point about single person. He wants to make it about groups. And he says, when you have a majority of people, a large group of people, it is very likely that any effect they produce is merely by chance. And we're going to see further why this is in a second, but here's another point at which I want to indicate Socrates' fundamental skepticism and rejection of democracy. Because for him, the majority, right, could be perfectly encapsulated by a democratic republic. So in a, in a democracy, we say, Okay, we need to decide what laws to pass. We need to decide who should be our politicians and leaders. We'll put it to a majority vote. And one thing that Socrates is so troubled by, he says, most people in most domains of life don't have the requisite knowledge. Most people don't ha really truly have the requisite knowledge to know what policies or laws will be best. I mean, think about the knowledge you'd have to have, economics, uh, foreign affairs, uh, political science, or et cetera, et cetera. You'd have to have all sorts of highly technical knowledge. How many people have that knowledge? Only a very small subset of experts, as we'll get to in a second. So he says, you know, the majority don't generally have knowledge of what they're doing. They act in a sort of chaotic or random way. Whatever feels good is what they do. And especially when people get in groups, they feed off of each other. And they may be very convinced they're doing the right thing, but they're, the per, effects they produce are by chance because they don't understand what they do, they're doing. They don't truly have reasoning behind what they're doing. And if that's the case, then Socrates is going to say, look, uh, if I want to become more wise, if I want to pursue knowledge, I'm not going to go consult the majority. They can't make me wise. I mean, just put it in an educational context. If you want to learn about philosophy or economics or chemistry, do you go to the average person on the street, or do you go to a professor, an expert, someone with a PhD in that subject matter? Usually, the expert, not the majority, is who you go to to become wise. Now, why this matters, if we put these two claims together, P1 and P2, we get the conclusion that the majority cannot produce the greatest good of the human soul. Okay, so the majority can't do what's best for us. Fair enough. Then he adds this third crucial claim. Someone can cause the greatest harm in some domain if and only if that person can also cause the greatest good. Now I'll explain why Socrates thinks this in a moment, but basically what he's saying is this. Look, someone can only do what's worst for you if they can also do what's best for you. In, on a specific topic or subject matter or activity, right? Now, if that's true, then think about what we said. We said, well, the majority can't do its best for you, can't make you wise. It would also follow, and this is the final conclusion, that the majority cannot cause you the greatest harm. If the majority cannot improve the human soul and make it better, the majority also cannot make it worse. They can't produce the greatest harm to the human soul. And this is why we see Socrates saying, I only wish, Credo, that the majority could do the very worst things. 
then they might also be able to do the very best ones, and everything would be fine. But as it is, they can do neither. The majority can't make us better. They also can't make us worse. So when Credo says, well, Socrates, you need to worry about the majority because they can harm you, Socrates says, no, they can't, because they don't truly understand how to make the soul better or worse. Now, we might question this claim, because think in general about whether this is actually true. Do you need to be an expert in some subject area and know how to do what's best in that subject area in order to do what is worst in that subject area? Let me take an example. I know absolutely nothing about cars. I mean, I know how to drive one, and I can do what, do so reasonably well. It's not like I'm racking up uh, uh, traffic tickets or anything. I can drive one, but it's a car is essentially a black box to me. I know how to work it, but I have no idea what goes on inside or how it actually works. So, if you had something wrong with your car, you wouldn't take it to me, because I couldn't improve your car. I couldn't fix what's wrong with it. I couldn't put in a nice souped-up engine, that cool sound system. I couldn't do any of that, because I'm not an expert on automobiles. Yet, even though I'm not an expert on automobiles, I feel like I actually can do some serious damage to a car. I could crash it on the street, I could not get its oil changed and never rotate the tires, I could also take a sledgehammer to the car and repeatedly smash it for an hour, and I feel like that would probably do some damage. Now, so we might wonder, well, is this true? Because this seems to be a counterexample. This seems to be a situation in which one who's not an expert can actually do some rather significant harm. And But Socrates seems to think there's something more going on here. In, in another um, of his dialogues, is the most, uh, most famous of Plato's dialogues, actually, The Republic, he also gives the following example. He says, um, And the one who is most able to guard against disease is most able to produce it unnoticed. So if you are a doctor, if you are an expert at guarding against disease, then we might say, well, look, a lot of people can get you sick, right? If you, you know, have some sort of illness and you shake someone's hand or you sneeze on them, that can get a person sick. But a doctor can not only, right, get you sick, but do it in the most nefarious ways. Someone who's an expert in illness will be able to, let's say, make you ill, get you sick in a way you couldn't notice, in a way that would attack your immune system more acutely, that would take uh, advantage of any underlying vulnerabilities that you might have. And the average person couldn't do that. And I think to some extent this is what Socrates is claiming here. He's not saying that non-experts can never harm you. But he's saying they can't do the worst harm to you. The average person can make you sick, right? The average per person can ruin your car. The average person can ruin your relationships with another person. But an expert in cars, an expert in disease, an expert in relationships can ruin your, um, your car, your body, and your relationships most efficiently. And I think this is the idea Socrates is getting at. So he's saying, look, yes, because the majority are not experts in what makes the human soul good, they might be able to do you some harm, but they don't really have the knowledge and expertise to do you the most harm possible, to do the worst things to you. And remember, that was, uh, that was Credo's initial claim. He said that Socrates' position right now shows the majority can do the worst things to you. But that itself, of course, betrays a misunderstanding about what's really worse the worst thing. Because Socrates thinks being exiled, being put in prison, being killed even, that's not what's worse, the worst thing for you. The worst thing for you is damage to your soul, damage to your moral character. Okay. So this is the first argument Socrates uses to say, uh, yeah, we shouldn't really be so worried about the majority harming us. Anything they can take away from us isn't that important. Now, Credo also adds some additional um, you know, sort of considerations here. He tries to put Socrates at, re at ease about, you know, Socrates is worried Credo might get in trouble. He says, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and, you know, he says, I can assure your escape without any harm redounding onto us or your friends. And 
Crito also says Socrates will be able to continue his philosophical mission elsewhere. In the Apology, Socrates said, look, I have an absolute commitment to philosophy. I cannot sacrifice it at any cost. And Crito says, well, you can go somewhere else, and there'll be plenty of people who want to talk to you, for instance, in Thessaly. So he adds those practical considerations. But where the dialogue on this point really gets started is when Crito says the following. When he says, besides Socrates, I think what you're doing, Socrates, I think what you're doing isn't just. And this is the point that Crito really needs to make. It's not enough for him to say that um, Socrates can get away with it, or he'll be personally happy if he escapes prison. What he needs to show is that remaining in prison isn't a just thing to do, that he'd be doing something morally wrong. As you've seen, and as Socrates mentions in this dialogue, he is the sort of person whose character is fundamentally shaped by doing the morally right thing. And so this it's, is fundamental, absolute commitment. It's why he thinks it would be wrong of him to quit philosophy, because he has a duty to continue philosophizing. So if Credo can make the case that it would be unjust of Socrates to remain in prison, then that would be something Socrates would care about. The question is whether he can make that case. Now, Credo brings up another a number of considerations. He says, well, you know, who, you might say, well, okay, if it's unjust, who am I being unjust toward? He suggests you're being unjust to yourself, you're throwing your life away, you would be unjust to your children, you have three children, you're leaving behind with no one to rely on. And he also suggests that could be, many people would see it as a sort of cowardice, right? You had an opportunity to escape, well, why didn't you? Were you afraid? Were you afraid the plan wouldn't work? And there you are cowering in your cell. That would seem to be a vice, it would be a lack of virtue. So Credo brings up all these points. And Credo also apparently seems to think that what he said is sufficient, because he says to Socrates that, look, we could go on in a philosophical discussion like you're always doing, but let's be honest, uh, the ship from Delos is going to be back soon, your execution is nigh, we need to get out of here right now, and there just isn't time for deliberating. Come deliberate, or he says, or rather, at this hour, it's not a matter of deliberating, but of having deliberated already, and only one decision remains. So he's trying to impress upon Socrates the idea that he desperately needs to get out of prison now, we don't have time to talk about this, and of course, for Socrates, that simply isn't going to work. I suggested to you that he talks about how doing what's morally right and just is part of his very character, and that's because he thinks doing what is unjust proceeds from ignorance, and that harms your soul and makes you worse. And so he suggests here, you see, I'm not the sort of person who's just now for the first time persuaded by nothing within me except that the argument that a rational reflection seems best to me. I've always been like that. So Socrates says, it's part of my very character to only accept a course of action if it can be supported by reason and argument. Otherwise, I might be doing something unjust. So it doesn't matter if you say that my death is, is close. It doesn't matter if you say we don't have time. To now say that, well, urgency and expediency causes me to have to go against philosophy, for Socrates would be to give up his integrity, give up who he is as a person. So Credo is going to need to make the case to Socrates that it's actually justice, it, it is a just thing to do, it's an acceptable thing to do to escape prison. Now, there's a second argument that Socrates makes here against the majority, and to understand this, we have to sort of separate two things. So the previous argument we looked at really focused on what we might call the force of the majority. That is, what, is, what are the sort of physical or direct harms that the majority can do to someone, like killing you or exiling you or putting you in prison? But there's another way we might think about the, the majority. Remember, Credo also said, well, Socrates, we have to think about what are people going to think of us? What would most people, what would the majority opinion be if you remained in prison? So the first argument we already looked at, the good harm parity argument, said there isn't really much force in the majority. They can kill you, but they can't take away what's really important. But what about this idea of the opinion of the majority? Maybe this has more plausibility, because... I'm sure you can think of times in your life when you said, okay, I'm not sure what to do. 
Um, I'm thinking about a couple of different options or decisions. It's not really clear to me. Maybe I'll see, you know, what would most people do? Maybe I'll ask some of my friends and, you know, whatever majority of, of, they, of my friends think, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe that's good guidance. And so we might say here, well, yeah, I mean, sometimes we got to trust the majority. Sometimes we have to say that their opinions are good and that we should follow them. Interestingly, what Socrates argues is that not only does the majority not have any force over us, they can't really harm us in a direct way, um, also their opinions are completely irrelevant. And we shouldn't trust them. And this second argument he gives against the majority, I'm going to call the argument from expert opinion. So the first premise that I've outlined is that we should only value the opinions of wise people and not place any value upon the opinions of unwise people. And we see Socrates explain this below. Is it true or not that one should pay attention to some opinions but not others? Um, one should take some people's opinions seriously but not other people's opinions seriously? And specifically, whose opinions? Well, we should value, we should value good opinions but not bad ones. Now, and the good opinions are of the wise people and bad ones of the unwise. Now, when you put it like that, it seems clear, like, okay, if I'm trying to figure out what I should do, what course of action I should take, and I'm going to trust the opinion of another person, I mean, should I value the opinions of a wise person? Certainly, I wouldn't want to follow someone who's unwise. It's also instructive, though, how often we don't think about this, even though when you just state it like that, it seems obvious. Many times, as I suggested, when you're thinking about what to do, you might say, well, I'll ask some of my friends or my family and see what most of them think is good to do. But have you asked yourself, well, are these people wise about what you're attempting to do? Are they experts in any way? Or are they just the people around you who are close to you? And if the mere fact that the people you live by or are close by doesn't make them experts in whatever you're doing, then why do you care about their opinions? Likewise, why should Socrates care about the majority opinion if it's just made up of unwise people? Okay, so this first premise Saint claims seemingly plausibly we should just care about the va and value the opinions of the wise. Second premise, in matters pertaining to some domain, of no some domain of knowledge, the majority will be unwise about it and the minority of experts will be wise. So the basic idea here is no matter what um, domain of knowledge you take or what activity you take, whether it's being an auto mechanic or being a philosopher or, um, or being an athlete, if you want to improve, um, the people who know how you should improve will be a minority of experts. And I won't go too far into this because we've actually already seen an example of Socrates making this, in point, this point in the Apology with his horse trainer analogy where he says, well, yeah, if you want to improve horses, you go to the very few... Um, expert horse trainers. And he makes the same point here. So he says, when a man is primarily engaged in physical training, does he pay attention to the praise or blame or opinion of every man, or only to those of the man who's a doctor or a trainer? So same point, if you're a, a good athlete, you don't want to just ask an average uh, Joe on the street what to do, you want to go to a doctor or a trainer, uh, someone who really knows how to improve you as an athlete. Right, so who are the wise people? It will be a minority of experts. And if those two premises are true, then we get the first conclusion that in matters pertaining to some domain of knowledge, we should only value the opinion of the minority of experts and not the majority. Okay, so the next question we have to consider then is, what is the domain of knowledge we're talking about in this current instance and who are the experts? And here's the third premise of the argument as I've outlined, as I've outlined it. And matters pertaining to the good of the soul. Remember, this is what is at issue here. We're talking about should Socrates stay in prison or escape? And we're worried, is this a moral action or an immoral action? And we said um, whether our actions are moral and immoral can affect the health of our soul. So we're saying, who are the experts uh, pertaining to the good of the soul? Well, the minority of experts on this issue is constituted by those with expertise in justice and injustice. And that means the only opinions, and this is the, the final conclusion of the argument, the only opinion, opinions Socrates should care about are the opinions of those who are 
experts in justice and injustice or those with moral expertise. Right? And he says, look, if we don't follow the opinions of those who are experts in morality, experts in justice and injustice, he says, if we don't follow those opinions, we shall seriously damage and maim that part of us, the soul, as we used to say, which is made better by what's just, but is destroyed by what's unjust. So the effects here are, in fact, dire. If we don't follow the expertise of those who know about justice and injustice, we will, in fact, harm our soul. And this should, of course, be an important point, because both Socrates and Credo agree um, that just as it's, our lives would not be worth living with a wretched, seriously damaged body, the same must be true about the soul. Life would not be worth living with a wretched and seriously damaged soul. And in fact, as they both agree in this passage, the soul, the health of the soul is even more valuable. So with this argument, Socrates has shown that even if we just are talking about the opinion of the majority, it really should hold no weight. The only opinions that should matter to us are those with moral expertise. And so that's why Socrates concludes, he says, Think instead of what the person who understands just and unjust things will say, the one man and the truth itself. So, this argument brings up some interesting questions. And most specifically, it's interesting that Socrates never tells us exactly who are these moral experts. He says we should trust the moral experts, people with expertise in justice and injustice, and ignore the majority. But who are these moral experts? And in fact, one thing I would invite you to, to think about, and this is one of the discussion questions for this lesson, is do you think moral expertise is possible? We accept scientific expertise and auto, automotive expertise and expertise in plumbing and expertise in art, but sometimes we may not be so quick to accept moral expertise. So for instance, imagine you're making a moral decision about whether to you should tell a lie or not tell a lie. Now you might ask, well, if Socrates is right, I should trust the moral experts. Who are the moral experts? Well, who studies morality? Well, in fact, philosophers do. So imagine, for instance, that I came up to you. I said, well, I have a PhD in philosophy. I've studied all the major ethical and moral theories. Um, I've thought very deeply about this, these issues for many years. So tell me about your situation. I'll make a recommendation to you about what what should be done. Would the mere fact that I had those credentials, that I had studied philosophy, would that lead you to think I was a moral expert? Would you be more likely to trust your own judgment, or would you be more likely to trust my judgment, or some other philosopher who studies ethics? Now, so we can't, I'm not going to give you an answer to that question here, but I do invite you to think about that, because it really does get to the core of what Socrates thinks about the majority, and this idea that we should trust moral expertise. Okay, so I will stop the video there. I hope the video, as always, was helpful, useful, and at least somewhat entertaining. And I will see you in the uh, next video.